In this question, we're given an original function f of x and asked to transform it into a new function g of x based on the formula that's provided. So in the formula, we can see several transformations occurring. And it can be a little tricky to translate this f of x into g of x using the transformation rules. So let's take a look at the formula and see what kind of transformations are occurring, first of all. Here we see an 8 that is alone. That's going to be a vertical shift. And this is going to be up 8 units because it is positive. It's following the rule of f of x plus k being a vertical shift of k units. We also see here that there's a negative applied to the outside of the function f. That's going to be a vertical reflection. It follows the rule of negative f of x, representing a vertical reflection. And then we have some operations that are occurring inside the parentheses here. We see that there is a negative applied to the x. So this would be a horizontal reflection. So the horizontal reflection follows the rule of f of negative x, representing a flip of the function across the y-axis. Down here we see that the x is being divided by 6. This will represent a horizontal stretch. And this will be by a factor of 6. And this illustrates the rule f of omega times x where there's a horizontal stretch or compression, depending on the situation. And then finally, we see that there's a number that is being added. Now that should represent a horizontal shift of some kind. However, the horizontal shift amount can only really be determined when we see that number being subtracted from the variable itself without a negative on the variable. So one of the things I might do first, I know there's going to be a horizontal shift of some kind using the rule of f of x minus h. So we have to find out what h would be in this situation. So what I might do is take this formula for g of x and rewrite it in a form that allows us to see more clearly what the horizontal shift is. And a way I could do that is by just getting the x to be positive by factoring out a negative here. So I'll take a negative out and then make this negative 4 plus x. Leave the 6 alone. And now we have a number being subtracted directly from x. And so this is a better way to look at it's a better way to look at the problem because now we can more clearly see that this represents a horizontal shift
of four units to the right. So when it comes to transformations that are happening inside the parentheses here, sometimes it's said that the effect that they have seems like the opposite of what one would expect. For example, if you have a horizontal shift of subtracting h units from x, this results in going h units to the right. But sometimes people think subtraction would take you to the left. Just as an example here, if we plot the common function y equals x squared, Let's say I plug in a horizontal shift of four units by subtracting. This type of shift moves our parabola to the right, even though a subtraction is in the formula. So it has the opposite effect of what you'd expect. The same kind of thing would happen with us applying a multiplication on the x. For example, if I take the x and multiply it by 6, instead of making this into a horizontal stretch, like one might expect, it ends up being a compression. This could be seen even more clearly in the function sine x, which is like a slinky or spring type of shape. If we were to do f of 6x, you might think that it would stretch out, the spring, stretch out the slinky, but it doesn't. It actually compresses it. In order to stretch the thing out, we want a factor of 1 6th, actually. So there's this theme of any time we do some kind of operation inside the parentheses, it has the opposite intended effect. And so now we have to figure out in what order do we transform the points of f of x in order to arrive at some new points for g of x. Uh, when it comes to f of x, it's a fairly complicated piecewise defined type of function with three different segments. I don't necessarily have to graph the entire continuous function in Desmos in order to see what's going to happen with the transformation. What I could do instead is just plot these points of interest. And if we can manipulate them and transform them, then we could come up with four new points instead of being located where they are now, they could be located somewhere else. And this could give us a good sense of what g of x really looks like. So what I'll do is I'll write down the points of interest. So we have Point one, two, three, and four. I'll call this one point one, point two, this can be three, and this can be four. So let's give their coordinates. All right, and that's the original points, f of x. We want to do the transformation so that we eventually arrive at g of x, where we have four new coordinates. Okay, but how do we get there? We want to use these transformations 
but the order that we do them in is going to be important. So let's figure out what order they should be done in. One thing's for sure, the negative on the function and the 8 here, they should be done last. Once we have a value for f of this complicated expression, all we have to do is just negate it and also subtract it from 8. So we're going to have several inputs, x. And those x's have to undergo a lot of transformations. Once the input gets transformed into this expression, then we do the function f, and once we have that output value for f, all we have to do is negate it and subtract it from 8. Finding g of x requires that we do 8 minus f of negative x minus 4 over 6 and the points are going to be in the form of x comma g of x. Before we get to that point we'll calculate what negative f of negative x minus 4 over 6 is. So this step is a vertical reflection where we'll take whatever f of negative x minus 4 over 6 is, we'll do a vertical reflection on it, so just negate its value. Uh, here we're going to be adding 8, so that's going to be a vertical shift. I'm just trying to find the order in which we're going to do these operations. So those are the last two. Now it's a little bit harder to figure out what to do first. Alright, we see we've got a horizontal shift. We also have a horizontal reflection and a horizontal stretch. So what should we do first to these points? Should we do a horizontal shift or a reflection or a stretch? So interestingly when it came to the outside of the function there we would just do the operations as normal. Outside the function input. However, when it comes to inside the input, there's this theme of things being the opposite, right, of what they might seem. So, for example, the horizontal shift, it says to do x minus h, but you actually do the opposite. If you have a, if you have, for example, x minus 4, then we'll move 4 units to the right instead of to the left. Here, you'd think that if we had a division by 6, then that would compress the function, but actually it has to be the opposite, a stretch uh, when we divide. And so when we do the transformations, we need to do them in reverse order as well. So we wouldn't do the horizontal shift first for the reason being that when we construct the transformation of a function, introducing this horizontal shift here would be the very last thing that would get done. What I mean is, if somebody had said to take the function f and do a horizontal stretch, then a horizontal reflection, and then 
a horizontal shift, here's how that would go, that problem. You'd start with f of x, you'd do the stretch by applying the 6 directly to the x, then you would reflect the thing by applying a negative to the x, and then finally we would shift it horizontally by introducing a subtraction directly to the x. So we would put these parentheses in place and, and alter what was there by subtracting. So since we're going to be turning f into g here, when we turn f into g, we want to do those transformations in reverse order of how it would have been originally set up. So what that means is instead of doing the horizontal shift first, we'll do the horizontal stretch first, then we'll do horizontal reflection, and then we'll do the horizontal shift. So now we want to process the horizontal stretch. So if we look at our formula, the horizontal stretch is a division by 6. So we need to alter our coordinates by multiplying each of the x's by 6. So we'll have 0, 2, 12, 4, 24, 3, and 30, comma, 0. Okay, so I've multiplied each of the x's by 6. That's the only change I've made so far. So that'll take care of the horizontal stretch. Now we need to horizontally reflect the points. So take your x's and switch the signs if there is one. Okay, next we want to do the horizontal shift. So in the formula below, this shows a shifting to the right of four units. So let's do that for each of our coordinates as well. Okay, then we're done with that. Uh, we now have coordinates which give us the outputs for these particular inputs. And just notice that the outputs that we have here are the same as the original outputs. So what did we really do? We found the inputs that correspond to those outputs if those inputs were to undergo all these operations. We can check our work by plugging in. Like for example, if x is to be 4, and we were to plug that in to the formula, we'd get negative 4 minus 4 over 6, which makes 0. And 0 is the input 
that was used to find 2 in the original graph. We could try one more if we let x be negative 8. What would happen then? It should transform into a 2 because if we plug in a negative 8, we want these operations to turn into a 2 because f of 2 is 4. So if we plug this in, it does come out to 2. So it checks. So this whole process could be thought of as a series of machines where in the original graph, all there was was f of x. And f of x was a function where if you plugged in 0 as an input, then what comes out was apparently a 2. If you plug in an input of 2, you got 4. But what's happening here is we see in the we see in the input to f there's a whole bunch of other operations that are taking place. So this could bring up several more function machines. Each one of them transforming the x just a little bit before it gets fed into f. So, so what are the operations that are taking place? Yeah, so according to order of operations, the things that are happening are there's a horizontal shift that occurs first. So you put an X in on the left. The horizontal shift says to take that x and subtract 4. The thing which creates the horizontal shift is the subtraction of 4 from the x. Then the next thing that would be done is that gets negated. So this would be a horizontal reflection. And then after that, we go on to dividing by 6. This creates the horizontal stretch. Once we have that, it becomes the input for f. But whereas we had the numbers 0, 2, and 4, and 5 as our inputs originally for f, now we're going to have new inputs that are based on undoing these operations that took place. So trying to take the 0 and the 2 and the 4 and 5 to figure out what values would have to be plugged in over here in order to arrive at those val values once all the operations are complete. And so that's why we would reverse all of those operations. We would add four, and we would reverse them by going this way 
to undo them and get back to the x values that we need. And so what I'm saying is that 4 is the thing that has to be plugged in to this machine in order for it to have finally arrive as a 0 right before it gets plugged into F. Now apparently for arriving at 2, for arriving at 2 we have to plug in a negative 8 over here. And in order to get a 4 when we get through these three operations we need to plug in a negative 20 and we'll plug in a negative 24 to arrive at 5 alright after we get those values we're gonna go on to process them a little more there's two more machines in the sequence here one of them simply is going to be a vertical reflection. So take the output, whatever it is, and just switch its sign. So the 2 comes out as negative 2, and the 4 comes out as negative 4. And so this is going to be negative F. Yeah, so this one can be called F, this function, and this one can be negative F. And then after that, we add 8. And that represents a vertical shift. So it'll be negative F plus 8. So our negative 2 will now become negative 2 plus 8, which is 6. Negative 4 plus 8 makes 4. We can put the rest of the outputs in as well. We have an output of 3 and an output of 0. They get inverted. And then fed into the last transformation, which adds 8 to all of them. Negative 3 becomes 5, and 0 becomes 8. So these are our final outputs then. And these on the left are our inputs. So let's write the pairs here. We want to do a vertical reflection of the y values of these points here. So we'll make that 4, negative 2, negative 8, negative 4, negative 20, negative 3, and negative 24, 0. The last step is that vertical shift, so just add 8 to the y values. We get 4 comma 6, negative 8 comma 4, negative 20 goes with 5, and negative 24 goes with 8. Alright, let's go to Desmos and plot 
g of x now. Okay, so we have the old f of x in black, and then the new g of x is in blue. Okay, so if I can just connect the dots here. There's a picture of f. So we graphed it. The next question asks us to find the domain and the range of G. So for that, we have a technique where we can find points on the graph, then project those points onto the x-axis. And what we're just looking for is like a shadow of G. We want to see where would we have domain for G. And there we go, that's a picture of the domain. Notice we don't have any graph to the left of negative 24 and we don't have any graph to the right of 4 and so those really are the values that are going to signify the start and the end of the domain so x could be anything between negative 24 and 4, that's the domain. Putting it in interval notation, we would do this. So negative 24 is the start, 4 is the end. What we can do next is try to project the points onto the y-axis now. The lowest point it looks like we have is a y of 4, and the highest looks like a y of 8. So just shade that in, and this represents the range. Lowest point being a y of 4, highest point is a y of 8. When we do our range, we want to put the lowest point on the left and the highest point on the right with a comma between them. So this is going to be from 4 to 8. So the y's are between 4 and 8. That's the start of the interval, and that's the end. So this is the lowest point, and this is going to be the highest point. These coordinates here, negative 8, comma, 4. Uh, that's how we decided that 4 was the lowest point. And then this point here would be negative 24, comma, 8. That's the highest point in the whole graph. Next, we're asked to find when is our graph increasing and when is it decreasing? Okay, so I like to think about this question as if a person was walking across a ground of some kind where it could be a hill, there could be peaks, there could be valleys. 
It's just a good analogy for increasing and decreasing, I think. So we always think about the person walking in the positive x direction and what their elevation changes are like is what we want to notice as they walk. So if you're going downhill as you walk to the right, that's a section where you are decreasing in elevation. That would be the case uh, here and also all the way to this point right here. That's a special point right there. It's the lowest point in his local vicinity. At that point, the person starts to increase in elevation, so they're going higher and higher as they go to the right. So we'd call this increasing. This is the cutoff right here at x equals negative 8. That's where the valley occurs. So to describe our interval of increase, it's anywhere from negative 8 to infinity. So just from here on over. And then when we're decreasing, that would be from here to the left. So negative infinity to negative 8. When it comes to local maximums, this is not a local max, even though it's the highest point on the whole graph. In order to have a local max, you have to be increasing on one side of it and then decreasing on the other so that it makes a peak or a mountain. Uh, that would be a local or relative max. So I'm going to say it doesn't exist for that. However, we said that we do have a valley right here at negative 8, comma 4. And so that's going to be the local min. It's a local min because not only does the graph go down from the left side, but it comes up on the right side. That's what we need for a local min.